In 2021, my best friend and I had a wild idea, and that was to ski across Spitsbergen, this Arctic Norwegian island, and create a documentary movie about this journey. Now, three years later, 2024, this 90-minute movie is released internationally on big streaming sites like Apple TV and Prime Video, and although me and my best friend worked basically for free on this passion project in those three years, we managed to get all the equipment we needed from clothing and neat goggles to skis and tents for free from our sponsors, plus the financial support to get all seven of us to Spitsbergen, across Spitsbergen, food for 40 days and finally get all seven of us safely back home. Now, the best part of this is none of our sponsors knew us before and neither of us was known or famous in any way. So, how did we do this? One foot in front of the other and then you do that for several days and suddenly you have crossed the whole Svalbard. So maybe you've already seen the film End to End Svalbard and if so leave a comment and tell me what you think about it. If you haven't seen it yet you can do so through any of the links in the video description to get a good scale on what I actually talk about and how this whole project looks like. To make it short, seven people including me set out for 40 days to ski all the way across Spitsbergen which is a 700 km route all while facing challenges from cold fingers to very thin sea ice and polar bears. So all in all a very challenging task we put on ourselves and especially for me the only creative person behind all this, being the director and cinematographer plus an active member of the group, I can tell you it wasn't easy. But there was one huge part in this whole process where I could basically sit back and relax. And that was getting the money. Now I can only assume here that if I would have gone out there trying to collect financial support for this film, it would have been a disaster. But I was lucky because I had Jonas, my best friend who happens to be a business consultant and he knows how to talk, he knows how to sell himself and he knows what to say to people to get exactly what he wants. Now, in fact, he's waiting for me at the minute to chat a little bit about the whole process of how he got those sponsors to sign up for a project in the first place and especially how to get their trust because they've basically been throwing money and free equipment at something where the outcome was completely unsure and what could have been equally a disaster for those companies. So while I created Antoine Svalbard creatively, I could not have done this project without his help being the producer. So let's see what he can tell you about it. Hey Jonas, how is it going? Hi Moritz, I'm good, how are you? Yeah, me too, thanks. Um, so let's talk about uh, a bit about our project Antoine Svalbard, the documentary movie we did uh, and finished last year and maybe you can start with telling me what your role uh, especially in this film and in the pre-production was. I was kind of like the the initiator I would say so um, after being to Svalbard for two years I had the idea of this project and um, kind of asked you because you were the or you're my closest friend who's and who you're in movie making. So I thought let's let's ask Moritz and if he's in, then I can actually start triggering the project. So prior to the trip, it was like having the idea, initiating the project, find financing the project, finding the sponsors, and then um, yeah, during the trip, I was just like all the others of the team, all the other uh, uh, five guys. I was um, just a member of the crew. I would all right. Say. Cool. Um, yeah, perfect. I mean, as you said, you kind of took on the finances of the project as well, because talking about finances, I didn't really do much there, uh, I think. And um, what I would love to hear from you is, for example, before every before anything happened uh, in, in planning or financing this project, what was kind of the first step we did um, in order to say, okay, what do we need to finance a project like this and to get sponsors? So, so the first step, in my opinion, first of all, was 
having a, having a team so so we kind of set up meetings with the guys that i know some of them you already knew then we had a team and as soon as we had the team we kind of knew okay we can actually uh, follow through with the project so and and then we knew okay we gotta finance it i promised the whole team that at least we're going to be able to pay for the snowmobile transports for the snow scooter transports um so the both of us we kind of sat together uh, if you remember, and um, we made this kind of marketing pitch document. It was like a four or five pages document um, uh, introducing the team, introducing what our project goal was, um, that it's not only about the expedition, but that we also want to shoot a movie. Um, so we kind of focused a lot about the content creation part in that document. And in the end, we had this five, six pages document um, with all the information needed about the project, all the information needed about where we go, because many people don't really know Svalbard or Spitsbergen. And the good thing was also for creating this this, this document that I've already been to Spitsbergen uh, several times. So we had lots of content, lots of pictures and everything to put on the, the, the pitch. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Like all the visuals we put in there were giving yeah. the potential sponsors maybe a good yeah, visual overview of what we kind of imagine yeah. in our head. Um, but what was the general goal with the search for sponsors? You, meant the, you mentioned the snowmobile transport, but so, was there anything above, above that, what you would hope you would get from anyone who wants to uh, support us in our film? Um, um, I think the biggest one actually was having sponsors on our side because it just makes a project more, more professional. Um, if if big brands actually support it, if big brands push it, they, they push it through their social media. That means more people watch the movie in the end. Also for us, it's quite nice to have uh, sponsors that give us gear and equipment and and everything. And and of course, in the end, it kind of looks better on the paper and on the in, in the movie if you say this was a project sponsored by, and then you list up the the outdoor brands that have actually been sponsoring us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I think it was a lot about also making use of their network. Yeah, And of sure. course, having a network in the end. I mean, it's super, or like like back, back then it was super hard for me to reach out to sponsors because, I mean, you go to a brand and you tell them, hey, we are a bunch of Arctic expedition, Arctic nature guys. We're going on an expedition. We shoot a movie and we want to push that movie that it's out worldwide and we have want to have movie screenings and then the potential sponsor would ask yeah can you show us what you've been done before and then we're like well we haven't um so that that made it super hard to approach sponsors in the beginning and then i kind of reached out to the contents that i already knew and i think matsus they were like the brand that believed in us from minute one i, I texted them i sent them an email with a pitch document and I think it took them a day, and a day later they answered, and they were like, "Yeah, we are in. <laughs> we just need to check the finances." And from that moment on, on this pitch document, we kind of just added the sentences: "We are already a professionally sponsored expedition." And then I went to the ISPO in Munich, um, and then I went around with that pitch, and it was way easier telling people that we are already sponsored and we just need more sponsors than if you tell them we are some dudes from nowhere uh, who want sponsoring yeah so that, and i think that was kind of kind of kind of kind of due that i knew some people at k2 so it was okay to matsus belongs to k2 and then matsus came in and they they were like they were they were supporting us a lot with skis but also fin financially they were one of the biggest supporters that we got in the end and that kind of motivated me a lot so right after they agreed i sent out emails to a bunch of brands quite a lot of brands and then I ended up sitting in the night in front of my computer and I thought oh it would be nice to have a brand that produces goggles and sunglasses and then of course first brands that come to your mind are like Oakley or, or whatever and I thought writing Oakley is probably probably lost time because they will never answer they're too big so I reached out to to the German brand Uvex and I did a mistake there because by accident I didn't reach out to Uvex but to their PR company which is based in Munich and I think two days later they texted me again and they were super stoked and they were like yeah Jonas that sounds very interesting 
By the way, we are doing PR for Icebreaker, Uvex, and Huckler. So it would be super nice if you could take all three brands on board. Oh, I see. And I was like, I was like, okay, I can do that. That sounds pretty nice. And then they um, arranged some meetings at the ISPO. And yeah, then uh, I think it was a month later that I went to the ISPO. And then I met those brands. And then one of the guys at one brand, uh, or one of the guys at one brand, she told me, hey, maybe go over to Deuter. There's a lady that I know. Um, just ask for her and ask if they would like to support you. So I went there and, and I had to talk with them. And yeah, then I just went around to the to, to several brands. When you approached those companies and when you and when you had uh, also the talks with them, do you, do you think that there were some personal strengths on your side that made selling this whole thing a bit easier, maybe? Mm, yeah, probably. Um, I mean, in my, in my, in my, in my job uh, at KPMG, you learn a lot of um, having meetings with companies, with um, head offs of several departments at different companies, and you learn how to sell and you learn how to to push your project through. Yeah. Um, but I think I think the hardest part, actually, or not the hardest part, but the the number one rule is uh, that you kind of need consistency, and you just keep on texting brands. So I think I came home quite late every night because the back then, back in these days, my job at KPMG was super stressful. So I had quite a lot of overtime hours, and then I came back late night, and then I sat down and I had this rule every evening to text to send an email out to at least two brands, and. What I think what brand managers quite often just ignore is if you send them automatically generated emails. So I prepared individual emails for every single brand. But yeah, the, the, the hurdle for us was, of course, with the like most, there were a lot of other brands that texted back and that were super eager to support us, but most of them just with gear. And I totally understand that because. I mean, I, I, if, if I would be in the shoes of a brand manager and an outdoor sport brand and someone who has pretty much no credentials, um, text them and ask for money and gear, I would probably also say, hey, guys, maybe you go on your first project, we give you our clothing or whatever, and then um, we see. And for us, that was, of course, not an option. So we needed the, fi the financing and the gear. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a very interesting point because... I was I was about to ask you if you would, if you like knowing what you know now, if you would in the future first do some similar projects that are way smaller on a way smaller scale where you maybe even don't need sponsors for um, to get like an overview of what you're capable of as a filmmaker or me as a filmmaker or you as an expedition guide and then to use those kind of small projects as a reference to get money for a big project like the one we did? I think you need at least something. I think if you have nothing to show, then it would have been almost impossible to reach out to sponsors. But the things that we had was some smaller projects um, that I, I would say we didn't do that, those specifically with the goal of pushing or of financing a bigger expedition some years later. Um, we just did them because we wanted to. Yeah. Um, so minus 18 degrees was just a random weekend and we were like, oh, let's go out and go for a, shoot a little ski movie. And uh, the Pyrenees Trail was just summer vacation for us crossing the Pyrenees and, and combining it with shooting a little movie about it. Yeah. Um, I think if we would have done minus 18 degrees, for instance, just with the goal of having something to show sponsors to maybe get them for an expedition movie, I think we would have not enjoyed shooting minus 18 degrees the same way. This way, minus 18 degrees was just a project that we made, and that was just a fun, a fun few days. Yeah, Same with the Pyrenees true. Trail, and it kind of since it was detached from any other bigger goals, it was having fun as much fun as possible. And I also think that was what made both movie projects, um, in their way, uh, um, successful. Um, that we because because people could see that we enjoyed what we were doing. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, all the movies we did before was just for fun, basically, and in the end, it helped us get the yeah get the trust from the sponsors for the big project yeah. so we didn't uh talk about acumen media yet that is a movie production company who uh joined pretty late as a co-producer of the film can you tell me a little bit about that uh deal and how that looked like um yeah sure so uh maybe to take a step back because earlier you asked me if there's like one 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 
talent or one specific thing that I was able to do that might be might be um, good to convince sponsors. Yeah. Um, and I think the one thing I'm quite good at is networking and keep in contact with people and and also just getting in contact with people. And with the Cuban media back in the, back then, they were named uh, TBD Media. Um, it was quite funny because. We were that. That was when we already had pretty much all our gear sponsors. So Icebreaker was on board, Uvex was on board, Matsus, Deuter, um, uh, Barnes Outdoors was on board. Um, they they all already were on board, and we already had a lot of money. Um, so snowmobile transports were long being paid for. And one year before, in twenty twenty two, I guided a short ski expedition on Svalbard together with Sigur um, and one of our guests he was uh, he was working at a movie production company in, in England I just texted him and thought there's there's pretty much nothing to lose and probably he's, he's happy and I think a day later he reached out to me and he was super stoked and uh, told us he would love to be on board of this project and I think that also changed a lot with that project because before that our goal was just doing this expedition, making a high quality movie and, and get it into film festivals, as many film festivals as possible. But there were no uh, bigger, bigger um, selling goals or marketing goals. Yeah. And, and then um, TBD Media, um, they started what they called us after afterwards, um, a, a few days later, and they came up with a plan and... They wanted us to have a, the website and to push trailers and they created an own Instagram account and asked us that we sent them content so that we, while we were on the expedition they can post and then they came up with the idea to sell it to Amazon and Apple and wherever they tried to get it on TV. And TBD, oh, that's well, something I forgot to say, TBD offered us, so if they sell the movie to, to a platform or to TV, uh, they offered us this 50-50 deal in the, in the, in the turnaround. So, so we get 50% of the earnings. Yeah. Uh, which for us, of course, was a big deal because before that, we didn't even think of selling the movie. So, and, and I, think, I, think, I think also, even though I like reaching out to companies and, 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 and selling things, I think I would have struggled with selling a movie because I literally had no experience in selling a movie. So that was pretty cool with TBD because there we learned, or I at least learned a lot about that. Yeah, what do you think? I mean, with all the knowledge you got from doing this project and like jumping into the role of a, I would say a movie producer without prior knowledge um, in this field, what would general tips uh, be from you to people that are just starting a project like this and to kind of want to do the same or want to do something on a similar scale, want to try to get sponsors for gear, but also for money and yeah, get, get f finances done for a project which they can't fund on their own? Mm, well, <laughs> the, the most important thing is getting someone, getting a cameraman who's willing to do it, even though there's maybe no salary waiting. <laughs> that's, that's probably the most important because that would have made the whole project way more expensive. If all of us would have demanded the salary, then this project would have tripled or, or quadrupled in, 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 the, in the expenses. Yeah. It was a passion project after all, this whole thing. Exactly, exactly. So we ordered it. But, but no, uh, jokes aside, um, I think the biggest tip actually is companies never reach out to you. So uh, when, when we're back in the days when we guys when we went skiing and shooting some little movies, I, I always had that dream of a company finding a movie on Instagram, reaching out to us and asking it to sponsor us. And I think that rarely happens. Um, so it's a lot of proactively approaching the companies. And I think once you accept that, uh, you just try and try and then also don't give up. There were many brands who turned us down and honestly, or actually that's even wrong. There weren't that many brands who turned us down. There were some who turned us down, which wasn't bad, but there were many brands who didn't even answer, um, which is even more annoying. Um, but it was just, just, just keep going and proactively reach out to them. And of course you have to 100% believe in the project. If you don't really believe in it, if, if I would have, if I would have, um, not believe that we can actually make this expedition or if I would have had my doubts in making this expedition, uh, then I think it would have been way harder to sell it. But this way I came to the, 
like I approached the sponsors and I was really outgoing and really motivated. And I think they could kind of feel that I was someone who believed in this project and that they didn't waste their money on someone who does not believe in a project. Yeah, I briefly met one of the guys uh, responsible for UFAX, Hagloves and Icebreaker and who got those three sponsors to us. And uh, I also asked him, why did they support us? Because we were not mm -hmm. known, we were not famous. We didn't do a project like this before. There was a like a long format project we, we wanted to do. And he said, yeah, those guys, they might not have something in their portfolio that is as big or they are not famous, but they definitely know what, what they're doing. Because he looked at our Instagram profiles. We took pictures before that we are passionate about skiing and mountaineering and everything. So I think having this in your in the back of your yeah portfolio like an instagram account where someone can see you're yeah. passionate about what, about what you're doing i think that helped a lot in some cases probably as yeah. well yeah, yeah for, for sure for sure and i mean that we we had the content on instagram backing us off we had the content on youtube backing us off And I had this education that the certificate that I was a trained Arctic nature guide backing us off. And if, if you, if you have a project like this and you want to have it working out, I think it's possible. It's just, you have to know that like, for instance, I, I have a story that was actually quite funny. The first brand I reached out to was, um, was Globetrotter. It's a really big, um, 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 um outdoor store chain in Germany and Scandinavia and, 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 in Denmark, it's the, the, the same company, but it's called Freeluftsland. And I reached out to them and I got this standard email um, with they get hundreds of, of requests like this and they can't even follow up with them anymore, which is super fair. Um, so I gave up, which was in the end a big issue because uh, a few months later, I ended up in a global trotter store and I asked them if they could make a deal with these Y food, uh, with these track and eat bags. And they were like, oh, actually, no, but how much do you need? And I was like, yeah, 700 bags. And then he looked at me and he was like, okay, then we can do a deal. <laughs> and then he asked me what, what I was actually doing. And then I told him about the project. And then all, all of a sudden, he got me the marketing contract of Globetrotter. And he was like, oh, shit, they would have loved to jump on board. But that was four weeks prior to the actual trip. So that was not possible anymore. So that kind of proved that um, it's always better to to not give up like because yeah. i gave up on global probably too quick and so maybe maybe we could have gotten gotten them on board yeah and also and that's something that's something i was really eager on when i initially when i reached out to the sponsors i tried to never reach out to this um, info at email address they have on their website oh yeah right because i think That is the email address where thousands of requests get dumped. And I don't even want to know how many um, um, unprofessional movie projects end up never being recognized, but also how many professional movie projects or movie projects who would have actually deserved getting sponsors end up because they write to these info at email addresses. So I was super keen on, um, on, on, on texting persons directly. So that was... Also, the reason why I went to the ISPO because I wanted to get because there they you can talk to the people, and if they're like, "Ah, oh, John, is sorry, I'm just working at sales," but here you have the email address of our marketing manager. That was, for instance, how I got the contract with Deuta. And um, it's it's always better to have a personal contract, uh, a personal contact. And yeah, yeah, what yeah. helped is honestly get a just for that time get LinkedIn Pro. Because then you can text people who you're not friends with, who are not in your network, <laughs> and that helps a lot. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, then, yeah. then you find these, then, then you find these people who are like, if you go to a brand and you want not to contact info at globaltrotter.com, but you want to contact their brand marketing manager, um, and then you can actually go to LinkedIn and you search for their brand marketing manager, and then you just text them directly, and that mostly helps. Yeah, that is true. That's true. Um, all right, I think maybe I can wrap it up just a little bit. Um, yeah, what you just said. That was so, quite long. Uh, basically, what we did uh, from start to finish is we set up a pitch deck after we kicked off the meeting with our team internally. We set up a pitch deck which explained everything pretty short and pretty yeah, nicely done with uh, graphics and pictures what we want to do. Then you approached the first company which in your case you knew but just the first company and as soon as the first 
kind of known famous company brand said they want to support our project, we could then say to other brands, look, we have a big sponsor, we have a big name on our list, and do you want to support us as well? And from there on, it kind of kept rolling and growing until we got to the point where we flew to Spitsbergen. Is that about right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think that sums up uh, quite good what we've been talking about. Um, thanks for joining and taking your time to talk about this whole process, with, which took kind of one and a half years and uh, I think many of your nights. Um, but in the end, yeah. it kind of got to a, it led to a nice and big and successful project. So probably worth it. Yeah. One warning, maybe. Big companies, they need a long, long time to transfer money. So you got to be prepared that in the end, you end up paying everything yourself and then you get the money some months later. Yeah, uh, that was probably the most psychological stressful part for me investing <laughs> quite a lot of thousands of euros in advance without having any security if I get that money from the sponsors. That was a bit stressful. Oh yeah, but it yeah. worked out. So in the end, maybe maybe if you plan a project, this be prepared to kind of borrow money from someone. Um, but there's mostly there is someone who can give you a few euros if they know you get they get it back. Yeah, yeah, that's true. All right, cool. Yeah, Jonas, I think we're we're through. Thanks for thanks for joining and thanks for talking to me for that long. And thank you. Yeah. <laughs> See you next time. Bye. See you. Bye bye. All right, there you have it. Some deep insights into approaching possible sponsors or partners that will hopefully help you and your future projects as well. And if you like this video, make sure to hit that subscribe button down below for even more insights into this documentary movie production. For example, how I supplied a whole group plus my camera equipment with energy in those 40 days. And if you think we forgot something or you really want to get some further insights on certain aspects, leave it down in the comments below. Oh, and before you go, I edited my call with Jonas here and there to make it fit into a nice and entertaining YouTube video, but you can access our complete call as well as the pitch deck we created over at my Patreon, which is free and which I will link down below as well. Cheers!